I left my notes back in Gomming, so does anybody have a phone book? <laughs> uh, thank you all for coming. That is very uh, encouraging. And I am, of course, delighted uh, and honored to be here and really quite moved by that gracious uh, and kind uh, introduction. As a sort of launching pad uh, for what I have come to say, I've come a long way, all the way from Gomming, and before, <laughs> and before that, the planet Pluto. <laughs> As a launching pad uh, for what I'd like to, uh, to say, let me begin with a very brief episode from the life of the poet Coleridge. I say brief because brief is always best. Shakespeare tells us that brevity is the soul of wit. And since I have only about 40 minutes, uh, I need to try and be witty and brief. So I begin with Coleridge. That would be Samuel Taylor uh, Coleridge, a splendid 19th century romantic poet who found himself one day eavesdropping on a conversation between two travelers standing in front of a waterfall, a cataract. And one fellow exclaims, why, this is perfectly sublime. The other fellow, however, disagrees and dismisses the waterfall as merely pretty, cute, charming, quaint. Now, Mr. Coleridge is horrified by this, and he thinks to himself, how could anyone be so morally and aesthetically obtuse as to miss the majesty of this moment. In other words, only an idiot, a complete Philistine, would not have noticed the obvious grandeur and majesty of the thing. It's sheer overpowering beauty which really no sentient creature could resist being moved by, enchanted by. In fact, Coleridge goes so far as to suggest that the encounter is so enrapturing that one finds oneself almost tempted to bend the knee before something so august so majestic. This is a glorious outpouring of nature's largesse, not to mention the God of nature, who of course has strewn his glories about the planet. Why wouldn't somebody be moved by the waterfall? And if you're not, then you really are sort of blind stupid, dull, you're kind of a nitwit. <laughs> because this is plainly sublime. Not to see it is to confess complete aesthetic moral bankruptcy. And it seems to me Mr. Coleridge is right. This is the usual reaction that healthy people have. It's normal, it's natural, it's human. In the presence of beauty, you are instantly beguiled by the beauty. In fact, you are intoxicated by beauty. And almost spontaneously, you fall into a kind of stupor. The Italian uh, is wonderful, stupore. You are stupefied. You are somehow hit right over the head by this beauty. And you emit, really, a kind of pulsation of joy, of delight in the presence of something so patently 
beautiful. And of course, like all the forms of beauty that you and I encounter in the world, beauty finally and mysteriously cascades down from God himself, who of course is absolute beauty and who dwells beyond this world. A great English writer by the name of Eric Gill used to say that Dante speaks to us of God, but so too do the daisies, the dewdrops, and yes, the dung. Everything speaks of God, testifies to God, to his mysterious presence, his transparency throughout the universe. And God, of course, delights, takes pleasure in giving us glints of his glory, tantalizing glimpses of the things that you and I need to know to savor. Pope Benedict puts it this way, true knowledge, true, certain, binding truth is being struck by the arrow, the arrow of beauty that wounds man, that strikes the soul, and thus makes man see clearly. Without which, uh, I propose to you, you might not find yourself drawn to truth or to the good. Beauty is oftentimes the prelude, the mechanism that catalyzes the experience of the good or the true. So we begin with beauty. It must be our first word. And the wonderful thing about beauty is that not only is it the least intimidating of the transcendentals, I mean, it is less threatening than the good or the true, but it is also that, trans that transcendental which alone awakens us to a sense of wonder, a sense of amazement. Pope Benedict has spoken of Eucharistic amazement. You trip over the wire of wonder when you stand in the presence of the Eucharistic Christ. And if wonder is awakened in the soul, there's a good possibility that it may lead you to wisdom, the Word, Christ himself, the Logos, the second person of the Godhead, who, when he became concretely incarnate in a person with a unique and unrepeatable name, was most beautiful to behold. Veritatis splendor, the splendor, of tr the splendor of truth which Christ himself assumes in his incarnate form. Veritatis splendor, perhaps the most significant uh, text, uh, the Holy Father, Pope Saint John Paul II, has left the world as a lasting uh, patrimony. To look upon the human face of God, which is what Dante did in the final canto of the Paradiso, is at the very least to begin to fall in love with the beauty of the divine and eternal love which lies concealed within the human being, Jesus. Now, when you say something like that, you don't need to flex your polemical muscles. You don't need to browbeat or become a bully. You're not hitting people over the head with syllogisms drawn from the Summa. No, you don't have to construct any argument. You don't have to prove that yes, you're gonna be surprised by the sudden splendor of the sight of God. You don't need to be persuaded that the recognition of beauty is something beautiful, dazzling, overwhelming. 
If the apparition, if the appearance were not beautiful to begin with, then where does the attraction come from? Why are you so captivated unless the beauty you behold is itself captivating? Either you see or you don't see. Hans Urs von Balthasar puts it this way in a monograph uh, he wrote on the pseudo Dennis, Dionysius the Areopagite. And he tells us uh, bluntly, plain spokenly, no explanation can help the one who does not see the beauty of divine revelation. No proof of the existence of God can help him who cannot see what is manifest to the world. No apologetic can be of any use to one for whom the truth that radiates from the center of theology is not evident. One sees or one does not see. Either one is all at once struck, blindsided by the sudden appearance of God made man, like the shepherds, surprised by joy, ambushed by the sudden unforeseen announcement that first Christmas night. Either you are struck dumb by that datum, that event, or the event arouses no interest, no astonishment at all. In which case, everything is reduced to a state of sheer, unremitting boredom, banality. I urge you to resist that tendency, to refuse the temptation to reductionism. And for that to happen, to surmount that seduction, you have got to permit yourself to be beguiled by beauty, swept away, transported, galvanized. And this, it seems to me, is the real center of Catholic faith, Catholic theology. What Balthazar has called the splendor, the radiance of theology. And he describes it as a devouring fire, a consuming fire that moves between two nights, two abysses, the night of adoration followed by the night of obedience. In other words, the whole movement of Catholic theology is nothing other than a transition, a sort of rhythmic progression from Joannine contemplation to Ignatian obedience, from adoration to apostolate, from worship to work, from mystery to ministry, from the dazzling light that emanates in faith from the human face of God to the hard and gritty details of discipleship, taking up your cross, following in the shadow, the footsteps of Jesus. Theology can only succeed to the extent it first falls down in worship, adoration, homage before the glory of the incarnate Lord. And then, of course, it gets up. It gets up in loving obedience so as to follow, to imitate the pierced and crucified Christ. Only beauty can save us now. That was the point that Dostoevsky made in his prophetic novel, The Idiot. An epileptic prince all at once is given an insight in his suffering, in his sickness, given a glimpse of the beauty that lies at the heart of all reality. When you get right down to the bottom of being, existence and eros are coterminous, coextensive. 
At the heart of being is love. The world will be saved by beauty. Well, I have an example. I, mean, I need to be concrete, uh, and I have a concrete example, which I shall designate as Exhibit A. And because you seem to be on your best behavior, I'll share it with you. <laughs> Let's treat it as a kind of viaticum for this journey that you and I are taking together. A wonderful Swiss writer by the name of Denise de Rougemont calls it a calculated trap for meditation to induce a kind of reflection upon the last things, the things that most matter. And see if this example I have doesn't lead us to the heart of the matter. And what is that heart? The transcendent importance of beginning with beauty. The indispensable place beauty occupies in the whole economy of grace and nature. The two are a kind of composite. It was more than 30 years ago that I first laid eyes on the city of Rome. This is a place whose myriad beauties I have feasted upon many times since. And it was my clever wife who sent me over. She had wisely intuited that America was not really the last word in the study of Catholic theology. In fact, there may be other places even more enchanting than, say, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. <laughs> so, she dispatched me to Rome so that I might check out this charming little institution called the Angelicum, staffed by busy little Dominicans, where I discovered a young Polish priest by the name of Karol Watiwa had once been a student. In fact, he was a student the very year uh, I was born, 1946. So we have something in common, uh, the saint and me. Plus, he served as an assistant in the parish where we lived in Garbatella, which was then a kind of spaghetti communist uh, enclave outside Rome. Spaghetti communism uh, is peculiar to Italians, uh, so it's harmless. They spend their days eating pasta uh, instead of staging protests uh, or shooting non-communists. Anyway, she sent me to Rome. Check this place out. Find out uh, if you can get in, if we can afford it, if they'll give you a degree in, I don't know, six days. And then, when I'm done scoping out the Angelicum, why don't you survey the larger scene? Because we're going to need a place to live. You didn't marry an angel. We have children. We're going to have to find a roof and a restaurant. <laughs> and her instructions were wonderfully explicit, culminating in this final admonition. And look, hockey puck. Don't get abducted by space aliens. You need to come home, okay? So I fly to Rome. It was dreadfully hot that week because it was June uh, when I had stupidly scheduled the flight. And I spent hours and hours in tedious and fruitless search of a place to live. It didn't take so long to find the Angelicum, but the damn place was closed. They had shut down for the summer. <laughs> everything, everything in Rome seemed to conspire to make my visit as unpleasant as possible. In fact, the five or six days I spent there were perfectly odious. <laughs> There was the awful heat to begin with, but there was also the noise 
and the dirt. And oddly enough, an endless number of Italians <laughs> who insisted on speaking a language I could not understand. I thought that very rude uh, and, and thoughtless of them. I'm very linguistically challenged, let me tell you. I've been in Gaming twice now to teach, and I still haven't mastered the Our Father in German. Okay. There may be some psychological uh, uh, imbalance, I don't know, or maybe a moral problem, but I can't say it in German. And I'm not done uh, with all of those impediments. I almost left out the gypsies. There were millions of gypsies, and they all seemed fiercely determined on divesting me of my money. Now, that wasn't very ambitious of them because I had no money. So by the end of the week, I had come up completely empty. So I figured it's time to cut my losses and go home. After all, there are plenty of graduate programs in theology in the United States. So why not buy American? And take it easy on myself. Uh, don't put myself through the meat grinder. Plus, I had a wife and two small children. I had to make some provision forth. So there I was on the very last morning of the very last day, surrounded, beset, by all these thieving gypsies, these screaming Italians, overwhelmed by noise and dirt and fatigue and heat, waiting for a bus to take me to the airport and praise God, home at last. Well, it was precisely then that I saw it. It, the Church of Santa Maria de la Vittoria, the Church of Our Lady of Victory. I had slipped into this church for just a moment because I needed to escape the awful world outside. And bingo, I had my eureka moment, an extraordinary discovery I was about to make, a game changer. It would upend my entire life, an absolutely stupendous discovery, which I'm not going to tell you about just yet because I want to heighten the sense of suspense, the, ho <laughs> the hovering sense of drama. And it wasn't a bowling alley that I had stumbled upon. In fact, this is a point that I think uh, you cannot stress enough. There was no intimation of the wonderment and grandeur that awaited me on the inside that I could possibly see or hear through the noise and the squalor of the outside. In other words, there were no epiphany rays dancing upon uh, the sidewalk, uh, bouncing off the facade of the church. In fact, there was nothing about that church from the outside that could induce me to enter, except I was bloody hot and tired uh, and frightened and broke. I needed to escape into some sanctuary, some place of repose. You must remember, like everything in Rome, all of Roman architecture is covered with layer upon layer of soot, dust, dirt, mud, reflecting the accumulating abuse of many centuries. The Italians are not at all like the Austrians. Italians do not clean up. They do not sweep the sidewalk. They don't even have sidewalks. <laughs> and of course, the automobile exhaust had not helped much either. So picture me, there I am, perspiring, perspiring copiously on the sidewalk, poised 
to enter into this utterly unprepossessing church, this boring building. And by the way, the building had been dedicated more than 400 years before to the honor of the Blessed Virgin. Because thanks to her timely intercession at Lepanto, a smashing victory was won against the Turkish fleet. It was the decisive battle in the effort of the West to secure uh, its own integrity. Vienna could have fallen, maybe it has fallen, but not to the Turk, to secularism. But back then it was a mortal foe and Our Lady somehow deflected it. So Pius V commissioned the building of this marvelous monument to Our Lady to thank her. So I enter into the stillness of this church and the moment I enter in, I am smitten. A great swoon of astonishment overcomes me because there, standing right ahead, not 10 feet away, was probably the most stunning example of inspired sculpture the Christian world had ever seen. Bernini's magnificent, unforgettable figure of Saint Teresa of Avila in a state of purest ecstasy, the transverberation. What Bernini had succeeded in rendering was the sublimest moment of her life when an angel, an angel of God, a seraphic spirit armed with a flaming arrow repeatedly pierces her heart with the love of God. Teresa tells us in her autobiography that the pain was so great that it made me moan and the sweetness this greatest pain caused me was so superabundant that there is no desire capable of taking it away, nor is the soul content with anything less than God. Once you are beguiled by beauty, you never get over it. And of course, I too felt the thrust of that arrow, however vicariously aimed four centuries later, thanks to the vision of this extraordinary artist, whose artistry, the work of Bernini, would prove so enrapturing during the years of our stay in the Eternal City. So of course we returned, even if we were gonna camp out like the gypsies, we were gonna go back to Rome. And we returned, my wife and the two babies, and there we stayed four and one half years in the midst of this great sea of Baroque beauty, monuments, ruins, statuary, pictures. And of course, four and a half years later, when it was time to go, we had two more babies. And I had a dissertation, a kind of postscript. The real work was the babies, and I guess my wife performed that. Uh, but there we were, four and a half years later, with a family, four children. I think of Aquinas, this passage from his commentary on the metaphysics of Aristotle, where he says, what is it that unites the poet and the philosopher? What makes these two people kindred souls? What joins the two of them at the hip? And the answer is they have a shared sense of Mirandum, the marvelous wonder, and that which makes us wonder. Like Shakespeare's Miranda, sleepwalking her way through that most magical play, The Tempest. And when she awakens upon all these splendors, she exclaims, O oh, brave new world that has such people in it, like Ferdinand, who somehow beguiles her. And he, of course, is even more beguiled by her. 
Well, we lived right in the heart of Rome. I mean, after a couple of years spent in that communist neighborhood of Garbatella, we had the good sense to move into the historic center of Rome. And we lived along the Piazza Navona, literally in the shadow of the Church of St. Agnes, another gorgeous jewel of the Baroque, a church built upon the ruins of what had once been a Roman brothel which was a place of horror and degradation where the innocent Agnes had given her witness uh, to Christ, where the enraged mob uh, literally tore her to pieces. That's a curious kind of conjunction of nature and grace. The day Agnes died, a terrible beauty was born, as the poet Yeats reminds us. And it is a wonderfully instructive story because it testifies to the power of grace to penetrate even the most debased and corrupt forms of nature. It's much like that other pagan temple in Rome where I spent uh, a lot of time uh, browsing, praying, wandering aimlessly and that was the pagan temple dedicated to the goddess Minerva, the goddess of wisdom. It then became a great Gothic shrine raised up in honor of the true figure of wisdom, Our Lady Seat of Wisdom, Santa Maria Sopra Minerva, Holy Mary over this pagan pile of superstition. The ancient and medieval and Baroque myth is that everything means something. Things signify because the world is charged with the grandeur of God. And if you have a sacramental imagination, you can take nature and see how grace rides across nature like a river, penetrating, piercing deep down. It doesn't hover over the flux. It doesn't skim the surface, it penetrates right to the bottom. Those years we spent in Rome were awash in the Baroque, a world of beauty suffused with so much imagery to awaken and inspire and excite the senses, revealing a great panoply of sound and shape and color designed to play upon the windows of the soul and thus lead one into the heart of the church, the heart of Christ. I can still vividly recall, as if it were yesterday, my old friend and teacher, Fritz Wilhelmsen, the finest teacher I ever knew, who first introduced me to the poetry of the transcendent. I can remember Fritz exclaiming with great passion that the defining feature of the Baroque is that it was never intended to symbolize anything. Instead, the Baroque was an explosion of reality. Chesterton says that sometimes in order to tell the truth, you need to exaggerate. That is a kind of hyperbole. But yes, the Baroque is a bit like that, an explosion of reality. And it is designed to move one in a very immediate, direct, dramatic way to an encounter with the living God. Fritz would say, the final test of the Baroque. Well, he wouldn't say it, he would exclaim it, shout it, uh, with that great sense of theater he had, his arms waving in a gesture of purest Catholic defiance. The final test of the Baroque, he would declare, declaim, is that no artistic snob can bear it. Its final tribute, its final tribute, is that no Puritan can worship surrounded by the trappings of its spirit. I may be venturing out into very deep waters, but it seems to me that if the Gothic is a lance aimed at the heart of God, 
if it's what Gilson uh, describes it as, an adroit combination of piety and geometry, if that's the Gothic, this sheer vertical thrust to take God, as it were, by the throat, a lance pointed at his very heart. What the Baroque is, is God coming down to take us by the throat, to lay siege to all things human, all things natural, and to pierce us with the lance of his own love, to make him more accessible, touchable. What you have to do is look at that riot of, uh, of angels dancing about in a Baroque space, the color, the shape, the movement, the texture. Bernini did all of that for me on that very first fateful day. He made me see, which is very important, the visual, that's the point of entry into the soul, to see the sheer beauty of his monstration of this most rapturous moment in the life of one Castilian mystic. Monstration, to monstrare, to make present, to render, to enflesh, to incarnate. He made me see the immense joyous possibilities of a life bathed in beauty, in the beauty of Christ. In Rome, the eternal city, but you know, Christ can appear bathed in beauty in any city, any place. The poet Hopkins tells us, for Christ plays in 10,000 places, lovely in limbs and lovely in eyes, not his, to the Father through the features of men's faces. So Dostoevsky was right. He struck the right chord. Beauty alone will save the world. He also said that man can live without science. Certainly I can, I can barely spell the word. Uh, I don't need science, I still think uh, the sun moves around the earth because that's what my sight tells me. So man can live without science. He can even live without bread. I think maybe uh, that needs to be modified. <laughs> but without beauty, he could no longer live. He would slit his throat. He needs to be able to bow down before something beautiful, the incarnate God. It is the wound of beauty that we are all waiting for. And without its having pierced through the senses to touch and ravish the soul, man simply cannot go on living. He will die of despair. Or as Thoreau puts it, he will live a life of quiet desperation. Because neither the truth nor the good on which we equally depend for that final nourishment of the soul can circumvent the attractions of the heart, the whole apparatus of sensibility. And as any good Thomist can tell you, that is always the initial point of entry into everything else. Even the most rarefied vision of God, the highest reaches of contemplative prayer, cannot bypass the sensible world. You cannot bypass the humanity of Christ. I think of this revealing line from the German poet Goethe. Is that how you say it, Goethe? Yeah. What a wonderful name. And it comes right to the point, right at the heart of the matter. He says, the truth about a work of art, any work of art, is that it is very much like stained glass. To see it, to glimpse the glory of the glass, the proportion, the radiance, the beauty, to be beguiled by that beauty, you have got to enter into the church, into the experience. You have to see it from the vantage point of the artist who fashioned it. 
And that's what I've been trying to do with my students ever since, at least since I first laid eyes on Rome. Let me conclude, if there's time, uh, with a poem. This is a poem by Richard Crashaw, uh, who was a great Baroque poet who fled England uh, in search of, uh, uh, of freedom to practice his faith on the Catholic continent, and who was a great devotee of Teresa of Avila. She was the saint of his devotion. The poem is called Divine Love. And I must warn you, uh, if you identify with it, then you must be wearing a size 15 shoe because this poem is intended for real athletes of the spirit, but never at the expense of the senses. Divine love. Lord, when the sense of thy sweet grace sends up my soul to seek thy face, thy blessed eyes breed such desire, I die in love's delicious fire. O love, I am thy sacrifice. Be still, triumphant, blessed eyes. Still shine on me, fair sons, that I still may behold, though still I die. Though still I die, I live again, still longing so to be still slain. So gainful is such loss of breath, I die even in desire of death. Still live in me this loving strife of living death and dying life. For while thou sweetly slayest me, dead to myself, I live in thee. That, it seems to me, perfectly captures what Teresa of Avila meant by simple transforming union. When your soul is caught captured by God, co-opted by God, and you feel yourself slain, somehow dart upon dart of divine love pierces the soul, and you long all the more intensely uh, for God. Well, right now I'm longing for a glass of water, and uh, I thank you so much for your attention. <laughs>